uh, let, me, let me run through some issues that have occurred to me, uh, some I had planned to say yesterday, uh, and others have occurred as we've moved forward. So first, again, 1979, Deng Xiaoping, this transformative figure, somebody who was emphasized by Francis. And one of the striking things was in that same St. Louis dispatch, post-dispatch uh, newspaper, you had the notion of a changing China. You have a portrait of Mao, he looks a little frazzled because in fact, Mao is being buried. Uh, the old way of organizing the economy was changing. And in response to these changes that Deng Xiaoping engineered, Time Magazine names him Man of the Year and celebrates his visit to the United States. Now this film is available to you on YouTube. And it's about relationships and it's about the United States and China and I would encourage you to find it and watch it. It's not a great film. Uh, the, the people who, pay, who play the role of parent uh, in this are especially wooden actors, but the film is about the grandfather and the grandson. And as you can see, the kid loves, he loves Spider-Man. And the grandfather, and the grandson, they're forced together through circumstances and have to find a way to work things out. And he tries to understand his grandson and he what? He uses this old technology, uh, the shadow puppets. He creates a Spider-Man shadow puppet for his grandson. And it's a very touching film and you might be able to show uh, bits about that. Uh, and I see that uh, Bill and others have asked me to say some more about social credit. Let me push through and see if we can have some time uh, towards the end to do that. The first thing I'd like to highlight is within China, within China, uh, there's been this explosion of self media or we media where people share aspects of their lives and other people watch. And in some cases, they have an explicit, explicit purpose of making money or attracting customers. There's a lot of that, of course, but there's also people who are suggesting, for example, that rural life has its superior features. You've had hundreds of millions of people who have left the countryside and moved to the city. And yet many of these people haven't necessarily found happiness in the city. They find urban life troubling. And so many people, some of them countryside natives, but others urbanites by birth, they are delighting in some of these rural folks who are bringing their life to these folks through various video platforms. And the remarkable thing for me is that some of them are reaching international audiences via YouTube. And so they are posting these things on YouTube as well. And these are Chinese oriented because all the language is in Chinese, all the discussion, the subtitles, all of that stuff. But we see rural life. And uh, in some ways it's a romanticized picture of rural life as pure, as people being more down to earth, and uh, you're breathing better air, you're engaged with the soil, you're doing stuff like this. And so uh, it's, a, it's a romanticized picture. Uh, people aren't putting up you know, pictures of them fighting with neighbors or fighting within the family and things like that, usually, but it's really interesting the following that they have. So this guy, I am uh, Zhang Daoyong, uh, Washer Zhang Daoyong. He's the one that I started watching first. And he has become less uh, prolific, but his wife was doing the videos and we would see him build this, build that, uh, weave together with his uh, relatives, various things. He goes into business, starts running a store. We see all of this. He doesn't have a big following in the United States. You can see, 
8,400 subscribers. It's not a lot, but it's more than a lot of uh, organizations have. I don't, who's watching? It can't be all people like Clay Doobie. Uh, probably a lot of these folks are from China and this is one way that they stay in touch with it. But again, this is the use of technology for self-expression, for bringing people into their own watching this. And it's remarkable. Uh, one of the more interesting ones is um, Pang Sao, Pang Sao Show. And so I, I don't know why she, she uses show in, in English for it, but she's much more popular, a hundred times more popular than Jia da, Zhang Dayong. And we see her farming, di planting, digging stuff up, and we see her cooking, life inside her home. It really comes across. And as I say, it's an international following. And so here's technology allowing people to express themselves and people who are generally not heard from. One of the things that uh, is true if you're looking at history is that we have a lot of documents from the educated elite, few documents from the less educated, uh, you know, maybe uh, working class elements of society. But now with these extremely good cell phones, we have new voices entering the conversation. We have a better understanding of the richness and the diversity of China. And I would encourage our Chinese language teachers to find ways uh, to bring bits of this in and to help your colleagues who don't teach uh, the Chinese language to say, okay, maybe you could use this 30 second uh, clip to talk about some aspect of life in China. There's plenty more. Live streaming is gigantic. Uh, one of the urban centered videos is this uh, Beijing, Beijing Xiaoshu video log. And uh, Xiaoshu TV is what he called. I, I started watching him. He would put up videos of you know, uh, the economic hardship in China. And he would go to North, uh, Northeast China. He hung around Beijing, that sort of thing. But uh, just about six months ago, he decided to come out to his audience that he's gay. And so he went from Xiaoshu TV to Beitong, meaning Beijing Tongzhi. And Tongzhi means comrade, but it's also um, kind of the slang term adopted for uh, kind of gay culture and people like this. And so he talks with people about it. And he also has, he's a little bit different in that he uh, can speak English, he's educated, he's also an unemployed engineer, and he's talking about workplace relations and things like that. So this speaks to the diversity in China and also the use of technology to bring people a richer picture. So it's not just what happens among government officials, it's not just this or that, it includes a richer a variety of life. Another uh, person, when I, I started to follow him. Um, he uses Xihua, which is one of the platforms, short video platforms in China. Uh, you've got Kwai Show, you've got a bunch of these, but he also ports this over to YouTube. And this guy, I don't know when he sleeps because he's forever on the road. His first channel was kind of the frugal traveler right? Uh, Pin, Pin, uh, Pincheng Yoja. Uh, but now he uses uh, traveling alone in China in English, and then it's, you know, Gurin uh, Yoshing, something like that is the Chinese name. And we see him, uh, he's insatiably hungry, so he's always going to eat and things like that. But it's been fascinating as he's gone around China. He's a northerner. He's spending all this time in the south, and one of the things that comes through is he never falls into stereotypes about people based on location. And that's, that's not common. That's not common. And a really interesting look. He shows you the menu. He takes you into his hotel room. You see all this stuff. Now, those folks are kind of everyday life. But the giant, and this woman 
makes Kim Kardashian look like an amateur. Kim Kardashian cannot match uh, Huang Wei. Uh, she uses the name Via. And there must be a story there. I'm afraid I don't, uh, I don't know it. It's possible that uh, somebody in the group today, we've got 100 teachers, maybe one of you know why she uses this particular name, but she is a giant. She managed to sell a rocket launch on television. Uh, and, and she operates within you know, this uh, Taobao platform and she managed to sell for $5.6 million US dollars a rocket launch. Uh, she does hundreds of millions of dollars of business every year, okay? She is a tour de force. Uh, she, we see what she eats, we see what she wears, we see different products, she can sell. And the platform is designed for that. And so she is kind of the extreme version of this, but it's fascinating. And I would really encourage people to get a sense of this. Live streaming in the United States certainly exists. And we know about, you know, YouTube stars and things like that. In China, they're called Wang Hong, Wang Hong, internet, you know, celebrities kind of thing. And you have people doing this. And you have Chinese uh, students in the United States. We have a couple at USC who have hundreds of thousands of followers in China, and they're talking about life in America. They're doing different kinds of things. So again, we, the, the technology has really changed how people interact, how people act. You know, they're streaming this on their food, phone, they're buying these products, all of that kind of stuff is going on. Now, that's part of humanity, that's part of life, the commercial aspect. But how about when you get sick? How about when you get sick? And one of the striking things that happened with the COVID-19 crisis is many hospitals set up telemedicine or what they called internet hospitals, where they would consult with people uh, who would show, uh, you know, they would uh, present via, you know, video conferencing and things like that, and they would interact. Now, we have telemedicine here. My wife is a nurse practitioner, and in fact, she's been seeing patients every day using this kind of technology, technology. plus she actually has patients uh, come to the clinic and she interacts with them face-to-face, mask-to-mask, as it were. But this is the use. And in China, they really lack enough healthcare professionals, enough health uh, uh, hospital beds, all of this sort of thing. And telemedicine, because of the build out of the broadband network, and Francis talked about this yesterday, because virtually every village now is getting connected and because they're building out high speed um, cellular systems, China's made this big bet now on 5G, uh, it brings some of what is only available in the biggest cities to the smallest places in the countryside. And so again, this is where uh, you can actually interact. So it's not, uh, this is not artificial intelligence, this is uh, human intelligence, experienced doctors interacting with patients. But we also have artificial intelligence, various platforms, and there are a couple. This particular one, uh, Ping On Good Doctor, uh, you know, Ping On, uh, uh, you know, Hao Sheng. this platform is aimed both at consumers, but also at providing a platform for hospitals and emerging HMOs and other organizations uh, to build on. So they handle you know, data collection, data management, and they use artificial intelligence uh, to help prevent, uh, you know, you, you uh, prescribe the wrong medication or that medication conflicts with something else. But here on the lower right, you have some examples of some articles uh, talking about various things that you can do uh, to improve your life and things that may be a hazard. And so, uh, in the United States, we have WebMD. WebMD signed an agreement a couple of years ago with Tencent, uh, you know, this internet titan. Uh, they are the ones that, that, that uh, have WeChat and a number of other properties. They, they came out of the gaming 
uh, the gaming sector to you know, world heights, uh, they have partnered with WebMD to try to bring some of that uh, to Chinese audiences. Now, some people believe we can decouple. The United States and China can somehow decouple. And uh, it's not at all clear to me what this might mean. I talked yesterday about the Trump administration very early on pushing this idea. They didn't use this term, and they talked about trying to have good relations with China, but clearly they were looking for separation. And that's where we're headed, uh, you know, all of this kind of uh, discussion. But I call it a fantasy because the reality is, is that markets, the size of the Chinese market is so enormous that no company would willingly give it up, right? No company would willingly give it up. And the reason why certain things are done in certain places is because of comparative advantage. It could be that there's an infrastructure there. So for example, if you want to develop something, Shenzhen is a great place to develop it because there are all kinds of manufacturing facilities that can make prototypes and turn things around quickly. And also all the component pieces are close at hand. And if you're successful and you need to scale up, you have workers who know how to do this. You have engineers who can prepare the products, design the products, and then workers that can help to produce it. So there's comparative advantages that aren't easily overcome. Roughly, you know, a huge proportion of the world's laptop computers come from Chongqing and Chengdu in Southwest China. You're not gonna change that. There's certain efficiencies associated with that kind of concentration. Uh, and so that's just a reality. So decoupling is a fantasy. Uh, now here we can see an example uh, that everybody knows General Motors, uh, American taxpayers owned General Motors as a result of their meltdown during the financial crisis. Uh, but General Motors has done very well in China. And see if I can get there we go. Uh, what car is this? This is a Buick. Uh, this is the Buick Envision. And I don't know if you've driven a Buick uh, or not, but you can see that they are very popular in China, selling hundreds of thousands. Now that's declined in part because Buick is launching a new model, uh, the 2021 model. But you can see too that beginning in 2016, these models started to come uh, to be exported to the United States. Now these are an American branded car being brought to the United States. We also have some Chinese uh, branded cars in the United States, not many and most under special circumstances. BYD in Chicago survived, uh, provided uh, electric uh, SUVs for Uber drivers for a period of time. But this is a giant industry and it's worldwide. And so we see, for example, uh, with the US-Mexico-Canada trade agreement, they've tried to set certain prices, certain labor rates that you have to meet in order to sell in the United States. And that was deliberately aimed at Chinese parts producers. And we do import a huge, huge share of our parts originate in China. But you can see that the trade war has diminished US vehicle exports. Partly that's because the car industry in China is going through a big transition. It's the world's largest automobile market, but it's now a shrinking one. So stay tuned. And this is that 2021 model that I mentioned. Now some decoupling is going to happen because of a desire for security. Uh, you know, strategic industries, that sort of thing. And I mentioned this yesterday. We're going to see some things located in multiple places. They may not be brought back to the United States, but they might come from some uh, third party, not all from China. Because as we mentioned, if all of your medicine is dependent on coming from a single place, that's a problem if that place has a problem or if there's some sort of trade dispute, that sort of thing. So for resilience in the supply chain, we have to have 
multiple locations and also for sustainability. Logging stuff uh, long distances is not necessarily the environmentally right thing to do. Locating production closer to consumers is a good thing. It's also politically astute. We saw this in the 1980s with the battle with Japan. In the 1990s, what happened? Japanese auto manufacturers moved to, uh, moved to the United States. Toyota uh, in, in Kentucky, uh, Nissan in Tennessee, Mazda in Ohio, that sort of thing. So sustainability questions come up in this as well. Now, the news as of yesterday is that uh, President Trump is going to force the company that owns TikTok to divest either the American portion of the company. And that company incidentally is, is located about two miles from where I sit right now, ByteDance. Uh, their headquarters are in Beijing, but their North America operation is headquartered here. And they already have several hundred workers. They were planning to hire a thousand more to work in online education and gaming, as well as their core product, short videos. But President Trump is ordering TikTok uh, to either shut down in the United States or to sell. And the speculation is that maybe Microsoft might be a buyer. Uh, stay tuned. TikTok is gigantic. You've had it uh, about 130 million people in the United States use TikTok every day, every day. And some people are quite addicted to it. And maybe some of you who do use it uh, can uh, you know, go ahead and have your confessional in the Q&A, uh, how much time you've got going. And I dare say maybe some of you uh, are streaming TikTok as, as I speak. Uh, so this sort of thing. But TikTok, uh, one of the concerns is data security, that it collects a lot of information, who has access to that information, and also the question of content, of censorship, whether or not Chinese standards of censorship are being transferred to the United States. And one famous case came up last November where you had this 17-year-old high school student who ostensibly is showing how you can make your you know, eyelashes longer, but she's talking about the plight of Uyghurs in Xinjiang, uh, the incarceration without charge, without any term of sentence. You don't know when you might be released. She's talking about that in this TikTok video. TikTok then shut down her account. It later said that was a mistake uh, and it wasn't tied to this, but it's something that has come up over and over, most recently in the John Oliver uh, Last Week Tonight program. And here there's an interview with her, uh, you know, done by the BBC. She's become, uh, you know, a media superstar as a consequence. Now, a couple of years ago, ZTE, a company that's not as famous in America as Huawei, but is a, a very large, uh, they make cell phones, but primarily network builders. And in the United States, they're headquartered in Dallas. They've been a sponsor of things for the Dallas Mavericks, stuff like this. But they've also been found to have transferred American technology to uh, Iran, North Korea. And so that's a violation of their agreement with the, with the companies, that their technology would not be so transferred. This has happened a couple of times. ZTE was heavily sanctioned. Uh, the US government imposed that. And then what happened? Uh, we had President Trump in May tweet saying, wait, too many jobs in China would be lost, 70,000. Uh, I want them off the hit list, uh, the sanctions to be dealt with. And they worked with the Department of Commerce. They paid a gigantic fine, well over a billion dollars. They're supposed to replace their board of directors, all kinds of things, but it speaks to this. Now, this is a domestic American concern. Uh, John Bolton and others have highlighted uh, you know, problems uh, in, in President Trump uh, not being concerned with human rights with regard to China and being focused purely on his relationship with President Xi and with getting a trade deal. 
So Huawei is this gigantic, it's the world's largest telecommunications company. Some people, I was uh, on a radio show and they said, is it like Apple? And I said, no, it's not like Apple, it's bigger than Apple. Uh, it doesn't have the market cap that Apple has, but it has the market dominance that Apple has. Uh, beyond that, it's also a combination with Cisco and Ericsson, things like that. They build the network itself, the, the machinery that makes all of this come together. Now, Huawei has been in the sights together with ZTE of the US government for a long time. 2012, already the US government was putting pressure uh, on this and saying, don't buy from them. Two years ago, uh, Meng Wanzhou was detained in Vancouver. Uh, we have uh, uh, with us today a student who originates in Vancouver. She talked about her own experience learning about uh, Chinese migration in a Vancouver school. And in Vancouver, she's been detained because Huawei is thought to have transferred and then hidden the transfer of technology uh, to Iran, which is something they ought, ought not do. And if you're Canadian, that's a problem in China, potentially. And so here we have two Canadians, the so-called two Michaels, who have been detained. Unlike uh, uh, Meng Wanzhou, they're not being detained in million dollar households and going to yoga and eating pizza. They are in uh, a prison where the lights never are never turned off and they have no access to legal counsel, things like that. So big issues, and I apologize, it seems that my logos have migrated. Uh, recently, India said, no more Chinese apps, no more Chinese apps. Well, in, China, in India, TikTok was number one. You had number four was a, a Chinese uh, file sharing. Uh, he this hello, a social media. And in terms of uh, the dominance of handsets, you have Chinese producers. Now, how are we going, and, and so that's getting at the question of banning, uh, the likelihood of decoupling. I'm gonna have to stop in just a couple of minutes, but one of the things that's going on now is the use of newer technologies and new opportunities to open doors. And so just uh, the other day, Amazon uh, said, we're gonna spend $10 billion. We're going to put up thousands of satellites that's going to facilitate building out a broadband network. Now the cynics in the audience will say, well, yeah, you just wanna be able to sell more junk, more stuff to people, right? Uh, but of course, having broadband access for the billions of people, the 4 billion people who don't have it, think what that could do. And we have been talking about technology as a saver, savior, it doesn't always work. Uh, for better than a decade, uh, this one laptop, one laptop per child program was out there and didn't transform the world, even though uh, it focused on trying to make this technology. What happened, of course, were smartphones uh, became you know, as powerful and more accessible. Now, who might be targets? How about Africa? And so you have uh, Japan, you have Russia, you have China, all trying to forge ties with African nations to try to get access to uh, the contracts to build out networks. What's the biggest cell phone company in Africa? It's this one that nobody's heard of, Trasian. And they actually don't even try to sell phones in China. It's a Chinese company, but it's too competitive there. They've gone to Africa and done well. Um, I'm gonna close out and, and, and clearly I'm not done and I'll come back at you later today, but technology and this problem, we are actually extinguishing lives because of pollution. Air pollution in the United States takes lives air pollution in China takes lives, a lot of them. And this is really pretty staggering, right? On the course of a year, 1.6 million premature deaths because of air pollution. So this is a giant issue and one that technology is beginning to address. China is investing heavily in hydropower generation, wind power generation, solar power generation, 
biofuels, trying to address that. And I'm gonna conclude here, uh, at least for now, with this pile of plastic. Uh, America and other places used to send all the stuff we didn't want for recycling in China. And then suddenly what? China said, no, we don't want your stuff. We're producing plenty of it ourselves. You figure out what to do with it. And we have not yet managed to do this. Uh, our first solution was to ship it somewhere else, to Malaysia. And a lot of people get rich. Uh, this is one of the richest people in Los Angeles. And this is, in terms of volume, the biggest exporter from the United States. But what are they exporting? Trash, cardboard, plastic, this sort of thing to be recycled in China. And ladies, gentlemen, thank you for sticking out part of our lunchtime. We are back here at 12.30. Uh, I see several people have posted um, questions. I will look at those and come back to you later today and try to get through uh, the rest of my slides and a couple of other topics. More on facial recognition, more on these kinds of questions to come. But thank you all for your attention. We're back here at 12.30. Have a good break.